what about the manger where the baby lay? It's not about the angels who sang for him that day. It's not all about the shepherds or the bright and shining star. It's not all about the wise men who traveled from afar. It's about the cross. It's about my sin. It's about how Jesus came to be born once so we could be born again. It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the cross. It's not just about the good things in this life I've done. It's not all about the treasures or the trophies that I've won. It's not all about the righteousness that I find within. It's all about His precious blood that saved me from my sin. It's about the cross. It's about my sin. It's about how Jesus came to be born once so we could be born again. It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the cross. The beginning of the story is wonderful and great, but it's the ending that can save your life and that's why we celebrate, celebrate. born once so we could be born again it's about god's son nailed to a tree about how every drop of blood that flowed from him when it should have been me it's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and i could have real life someday so that you and i could have real life someday it's about the cross It's about the cross It's about the cross Feel free to just sing uh, sing along with this one uh, it's, a, it's been around for, for a little bit so we're going to we're going to try to do it. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you, be still, will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all, I can only imagine. Whoa, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. When that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you I can only imagine, I can only imagine 
Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? can only imagine I can only imagine I can only imagine thinking about heaven this morning well there's no doubt about it if you were a prisoner on death row in the state of Arkansas, then April was a bad, bad month for you. You may have heard about this in the news. Early this month, officials at the Arkansas State Prison announced that they would be executing eight men before today, April 30th, the date on which one of the sedative drugs they used for lethal injections was set to expire. So suddenly, for eight condemned men, the expiration date on a medicine bottle became dramatically linked to their own expirations. Now, each of these men had been on death row for over 20 years, and they all had been convicted of terrible crimes. They'd been trusting in their appeals process for decades to avoid the sentence that had pronounced upon them to keep them alive. But now they were told that, like, Dorothy faces in the castle of the Wicked Witch, the sands in the hourglass were about to run out. And I wonder what in the world that must feel like. I mean, we all know we're going to die sometime, right? Hopefully later than sooner. But that's an irrefutable fact of life. But what is it like, do you suppose, to know the date on which you are going to to die, the hour and the way it's going to happen, to have folks taking down your order for your last meal, to be hoping against hope that a stay of execution will be granted and you'll be delivered from the death chamber. Now, some of those condemned men in Arkansas had come to know Christ as Lord while they were in prison. A lot of folks are suspicious of those jailhouse conversions you know they think they're just self-serving and don't result in any real change i think we have to leave these matters in god's hands he alone knows the heart and certainly for people in circumstances where they are literally facing death the prospect of eternal life must surely take on new meaning as believers we want to hope that those men who killed others who broke the sacred commandment have repented of their sins, right? Have come to recognize they were wrong and have sought the forgiveness of a God who loves us no matter what we do. That even as they spoke their final words, as the families of their victims bore silent witness, as the lethal drugs began to flow, these men were holding on to a promise. The promise of heaven, like Ellen talked about this morning, hoping their names were written there. Four of the eight were ultimately put to death in Arkansas this month. Two in one day. And I wonder where they are right now. Now I'm asking the question because whether we realize it or not, each one of us, before we came to Christ, 
we're living under a death sentence. The judgment of Almighty God rightly imposed on us for the crimes that we committed, for the sins for which we'd been found guilty in God's eyes. All of us commandment breakers were living as condemned people with the prospect of an eternity in hell stretching out before us, an endless separation from God and his love. That is, until Jesus did what he did for us on the cross. It's about the cross is what they sang this morning. And that's true. He who knew no sin took on the sins of the world. He took every one of our death sentences and commuted them to life. By laying down his own life, by surrendering himself to the brutality of capital punishment, Roman style. No lethal injections back then, only hammers and nails and crosses. Jesus chose to experience execution firsthand so that we might be spared. He made it clear to his followers he was going to go to Jerusalem and die, right? He'd be killed there. But he also made something else very clear, didn't he? And that was that he was not going to stay dead. That he would, in fact, be raised to life on the third day. Why? Because Jesus had the promise of heaven before him too. The hope that at the end of his suffering, after he'd made the ultimate sacrifice, he was going home, right? Back to sit at the right hand of his father, having successfully accomplished the will of the father. And what was his father's will? That none of us should perish but have everlasting life. And that's the huge blessing Easter brings us. We're not done celebrating Easter, are we? We got Easter to celebrate. Every Sunday is a little Easter, right? A little resurrection. The promise we have of what happens here on earth, for better or for worse, is not the end of the story. No matter how long we live in this place, when the time comes to leave, the best is yet to be. This is the promise that Jesus lifts up to Martha in John's Gospel just before he raises Lazarus from the dead. He tells this grieving sister, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me, are you ready? Will never die. Do you believe this? And, and Martha answers in the, in the affirmative. She says, yes, Lord, I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God who's come into the world. But the question is, do we believe it? Do we believe it? That even though we die, if we trust in Jesus, we will live. That we will never really die. That's a big deal. And a major comfort as we ponder our own mortality, our expiration dates. For those who put their trust in Christ, the curtain will fall on earth. Yes, it will. But only to open another curtain that ushers us into the corridors of eternity to be with Christ and all the believers who've gone before us. This is the promise of heaven. The one Jesus made to his disciples on the night he was betrayed. They're, they're weeping over his impending departure and the separation it will bring. They're trying to imagine what is, what is life going to be like without this amazing life force in it. At that moment, they have no idea that they'll ever see Jesus again because usually when people die, you don't, right? See him again, not on this side. So he seeks to reassure them in John's gospel. He says to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I am going there specifically to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, guess what? I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you to be with me. That you also may be. Where I am. Whoa! 
Did you hear that? The separation is only temporary. There's a place that's been prepared for us on the other side. We are expected there. This is the promise of heaven. And Paul says in Colossians that heaven, the eternal home that awaits us, should be a primary focus for the believer. He writes in chapter 3 saying, Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Now what's Paul teaching here? Don't become so caught up in what happens down here, as consuming as it can be, that you give no thought at all to what's going to happen up there. Heaven should be a destination that we ponder frequently. You're already thinking about where you're going on vacation this summer, right? Have you ever thought about heaven that much? You ought to. <laughs> That's what the scriptures say. It ought to be a place we anticipate with excitement, like, like the man in the song that, that the Trizzlers just sang about, who's trying to imagine just exactly what heaven's going to be like, who is trying to picture himself there. What do, you, what do you say again? Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Uh, will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or, or on my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. But how much imagining do we actually do? Pastor Randy Alcorn, who wrote a book a few years back, which was simply titled Heaven, thinks that Christians actually spend very little time looking ahead to where we'll be after our journey on earth is over. He writes as follows, quote, the popular notion of Christians being so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly good is a myth. On the contrary, most of us are so earthly minded, we are of no heavenly or earthly good. C.S. Lewis once observed, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. God commands us to be heavenly minded, says Alcorn. And doing so will give us the perspective and the motivation to live on earth as he has commanded us. That makes sense, doesn't it? It's one of the reasons why Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on where? Earth, as it is in where? Heaven, that's right. It's recognizing that there really is an extraordinary connection between the two places. And that, that as we seek to have God reign in our lives here, it will be more, all the more natural for us to experience his reign when we get there, right? Because we, we, we will have been living like that, in part, down here. But still, for a lot of us, mm -mm, I think a fear of the unknown can make us reluctant to even think about going to heaven. The idea of no longer being Jersey Villians, navigating through life, making our plans, loving our families, doing our work, and the, the uncertainty, the only imagining what will actually go on there, what we'll look like and, and what we're going to be up to when we're no longer having the option to go to Nick's Pancake House for supper or, or running to Redbox to pick up a movie for Friday night or heading to Walgreens to pick up a few things for the week. Things will no longer be needing when we all get to heaven. Earth has a powerful gravitational pull on us, doesn't it? Boy, oh boy. It's the known, right? It's the familiar. And sometimes it's the safe, but not always. Heaven is the unknown. Even though we have the occasional situation of someone going there in some way, shape, or form, and then being allowed to return and to report back to us that we've got nothing to fear that the water's fine that being in the presence of Jesus is so amazing that there are no earthly words to describe it still a lot of us are formed with the notion we got to see it to believe it right so what can we see from here 
What are some of the things the Bible has to say to us about heaven? To reassure us about one day being there ourselves. Well, we're looking in the book of Revelation this morning to find some answers to that. In our text today, John is writing about the visions he's given by God of a day of ultimate victory. Of a place where those who have followed God are gathered to enjoy Him forever. Where the hardships and the persecutions the early church was experiencing will be resolved. And all the challenges and persecutions and hardships we've been experiencing will be resolved. Where the ultimate battle between good and evil, the light side and the dark side of the force, will be won once and for all by Almighty God. Look what John has to say. Beginning in, in chapter 7 at verse 9. After this I looked. And, and there before me was a great multitude. That, that no one could count. From every nation. Tribe. People. Language. Standing before the throne. And before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes. And we're holding, now look at that. What are they holding? Palm branches. Where does that come from? What are the palm branches about on Palm Sunday? Welcoming the king, right? Recognizing you're in the presence of royalty, right? Palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshipped, saying, Amen! There you go, Eric Trisler. What's it mean? Amen means so be it, right? That's a done deal, right? Bottom line, signature, sign, delivered. Amen! Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor. And power and strength be to our God forever and ever again. Amen. That's quite a worship service up there, you think? What if they have bulletins up there? <laughs> How about sound systems, you suppose? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that was a joke. Thank you. <laughs> come on now. Come on now. Come on. Oh. Then one of the elders asked me. That is, he spoke to John. These in white robes. Who are they? Where'd they come from? And John answers. He can, I love his answer because John has no idea where they come from, does he? <laughs> He's like, I don't know. He says, sir, you know. <laughs> right? You know. Like when God asks uh, Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? Uh, and what's Ezekiel's answer? You alone know God. <laughs> And so the elder said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and they've made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And this is the really cool part here. Here's some specifics about what goes on there. He says, Therefore, it's verse 15, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Now, first of all, note the location. Where are they? Where are they? Specifically, before his throne, day and night. Imagine being in the presence of the God that we have loved and worshipped here on earth. The God whom we have known in part, but there will fully know, nothing to block our view, nothing to make us doubt his reality and his goodness anymore, nothing, nothing, nothing to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow! That's where we are. And what are we doing? What's it say we're doing? We serve him day and night in his Temple. So we're serving. We don't know exactly what that service entails. 
But it indicates that we're going to be actively engaged with God and the things of God when we get to the other side. There will be no hindrances to serving God there. No competing priorities. No overflowing schedules or calendars. It will all be about Him and His agenda, which will always be good. Right? Always good. And, and here's the other part. While we have sensed His presence in many ways on earth, His Holy Spirit dwelling within us, John indicates there that our shelter will be His presence. Did you get that? He sits on the throne, will shelter them with His presence. What that means? We are literally going to be living inside God. Never to be on, beyond the boundaries of His loving arms. Holding us close to his heart. Nothing standing between us. And then verse 16 gives some other cool specifics there. Never again will they what? No hunger. Never again will they what? No thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching Heat. Now, there's debate about whether folks actually eat in heaven. There's the marriage supper of the lamb. There's all the kind of images of, of feasting going on. But you won't need it like down here. And the, and the really cool part about it is nobody's going to be starving. No more poverty. No more malnourished, shrinking little children who don't get enough to eat or drink. No more of that. We couldn't fix it down here, could we? As much as we tried. We could never fix it down here. Up there it's fixed. And no more sun to beat down on us and no more days like yesterday in Jerseyville. Yeah. <laughs> Drowning in rain. Oh my. And then 17 there. Verse 17. For the lamb at the center of the throne. Who's the lamb? That's right. Will be their shepherd. And he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So in verse 17, we learn how all that's going to be accomplished here. Because the Lamb at the center of the throne, who is Christ, will be our shepherd in a different way than we've been able to allow him to be our shepherd down here, and will provide for every need that we have in the land that is fairer than day. That is, we will always be refreshed in his company. And all the things that broke our hearts down here. All the grief we bore, the disappointments and the losses that led us to shed many tears, those will be resolved in heaven and the tears they caused will be wiped away. If there are any tears in heaven, they'll only be tears of joy or the tears that come when you just can't stop laughing, you know? Because <laughs> it's so great when your heart is full and your soul is finally at peace. After all the struggles and trials and storms. Sounds amazing, right? Yes. But even in light of the revelation, you may still be asking. But won't I miss earth? And all the folks I'll leave behind. I like the way Randy Alcorn addresses this in his book on heaven. He writes as follows, quote. Have you ever bought an economy ticket for a flight? But because of overbooking, been upgraded to first class? Did you regret the upgrade? Did you spend your time wondering, what am I missing by not being in the back of the plane? <laughs> the upgrade from earth to heaven will be vastly superior to that from economy to first class. And the good news is, nobody will drag you off the plane if somebody else needs your seat. <laughs> ah! I won't go! Yes, you will! I won't go! Yes, you will! United. <laughs> if we would miss something from our old lives, it would be available to us in heaven. Why? Uh, listen, this is really cool the way he phrases this. Because we will experience all God intends for us. Here it is now. You ready? He fashions us to want precisely what he will give us so that what he gives us is exactly what we want. Did you get that? He fashions us to want precisely what he will give us. So what he gives us will be exactly 
what we want. Woo. So you wonder, well, do we become angels when we get to heaven? Again, Alcorn, who writes, quote, I'm often asked if people, particularly children, become angels when they die. The answer is, no! Death is a relocation of the same person from one place to another. The place changes, but the person remains the same. The same person who becomes absent from his or her body becomes present with the Lord. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians. We won't be angels, but we'll be with angels. All of us together in the presence of the Father. So if that be the case, will we really be able to recognize each other up there? If Kenny Beach or Janet Fireman or Johnny Wade comes around the corner, will I know them and will they know me? Randy Alcorn addresses this in his book too. This is what he says, quote, Scripture gives no indication of a memory wipe causing us not to recognize family and friends. Paul anticipated being with the Thessalonians in heaven and it never occurred to him he wouldn't know them. In fact, if we wouldn't know our loved ones, the comfort of an afterlife reunion taught in the scriptures would be of no comfort at all, right? In heaven, we will not fail to recognize an acquaintance in a crowd. And here's the good deal. Are you ready for this? You will never forget someone's name. No name tags required. You're not going to be going, oh, it's so good to see you, friend. <laughs> so nice to see you, relative. So nice to see you, customer. Ah. Uh, so we'll know folks who went before us and we'll meet believers we never even knew down here. I hope Lincoln's there. I want to meet Lincoln so bad, don't you? And I wonder if we'll see Kenneth Williams there. You suppose we'll see Kenneth Williams? He was one of the condemned murderers put to death in Arkansas last week. He killed four people with robbery being his primary motive. Vicious stuff. But in the 20 years since his crimes, Williams had become a Christian. He'd also become an ordained Christian minister. And he wrote an autobiography, primarily to warn kids to stay away from gangs. Here is a statement he read just before his execution. Addressing the families of his victims, he said, quote, I was more than wrong. The crimes I perpetrated against you all were senseless, extremely hurtful, and inexcusable. I humbly beg your forgiveness. And I pray you find the peace, the healing, and the closure that you all deserve. I'm not the person I was. I've been transformed. Some things can't be undone. I seek forgiveness. Eventually, everybody has last words on earth. Whether we know they'll be our last words or not. My hope my prayer is that when we speak those words we will find ourselves ushered into the presence of God more alive than we have ever been before there with the Savior who made it all possible by his broken body through his shed blood paying the ransom for our souls and in so doing Securing for those who believe the promise, the promise of heaven. Amen and amen. When the Trizzlers come back and they're going to sing songs about heaven, we know them, they're old favorite hymns. Do you really know you're going there? You don't have to leave today not knowing. All you have to do is put your hope and trust 
in Jesus Christ. All you have to do is trust that the words here are true. And not just true for Pastor Brent, and not just true for Joanne or anybody else here. They're also true for you. They were true for Kenneth Williams, a murderer who was executed in Arkansas last week. Have you put your trust in Christ? Maybe today is your day. We'd invite you to come and share a decision with us if you have one to make while the Trizzlers are singing. Maybe you have a, a sense that God's leading you to our church in a more formal way through membership. We'd invite you to come. Or if, or if you have a need to, to recommit your life to Christ, to rededicate yourself to God and who he's called you to be. Maybe you strayed away somewhere, haven't been living quite like you would said you were going to live when you promised Jesus your life. Maybe you need prayer today. We'll, we'll have deacons down here and I'll be here. We can pray for you as well. Uh, let, let's stand now. And the Trizzlers are going to sing for us and then we'll, uh, we'll let God's spirit lead.
Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that we